So I wanted to start off first about talking a little about, about planting dates um, and when you can actually get started, right? Because we're talking about the cool season crops. So the ones that you can get going with early. So what you're seeing on this, this map is, um, uh, you, you, hopefully you can see the, um, hopefully you can see the darker lines here um, across the state, which are indicating approximately when the average last spring frost occurs at various parts in the state. So you can see down here in the southeast corner of Nebraska, you know, April 21st uh, is about when that last frost happens. If you go way out west, you know, here in the upper uh, corner of the panhandle, it's more like May 21st. So uh, we have a long state. And so we have a, a lot of difference in when that last spring frost occurs. But you know, here in the Lancaster County, it's about April 27th. If you go just slightly west, it's about May, May 3rd. So keep that in mind. And the next thing that I wanted to show you here is um, this tool. And um, uh, so what you can do with this particular handout is um, if you look at the top here and the, um, uh, the days at the top, this, this instance where it says zero, zero, if you were to take this and you were to write in when your average last frost date is at zero, zero, then this sheet will tell you for each vegetable crop that you might wanna plant, um, when you would want to start uh, planting and when you would want to, what the growing period, and then when you would be harvesting. So the X's here for asparagus, the X's stand for planting, and then the uh, plus signs stand for harvesting. So if we were looking at an asparagus crown and um, uh, we put in our last frost date here at zero, zero, then we could count back. So um, uh, 10 days before the last frost date, 20 days, 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, and so on. You know, we could, if the soil is workable, not frozen and not too wet, then we could be planting those asparagus crowns at that time. And then we would be harvesting um, in, in this time frame right here. And so you can go through all of the different crops. And of course, I just have a, a portion of the page here on the screen. There are a lot more uh, vegetables on this sheet if you look at the whole thing. Um, and you can determine, you know, what are the planting times? When are, when are the growing times? The, the asterisk signs are the growing. And then the plus signs, as I mentioned earlier, are the harvesting, okay? So if you would like to download this sheet, you can find it here at go.unl.edu slash spring dates. And maybe one of my um, colleagues could put that in the chat box for everybody if they would like to um, uh, get a link to that. And then I have, there is a similar sheet available to this uh, for fall dates. So it looks very much the same, but here on the zero, zero, you would put in when is your first, your first average fall frost date. And then you would count forward and backward again for your planting dates for those fall crops. And if you would like to find that sheet, you can find it at go.unl.edu slash fall dates. Okay. So on this next um, slide here, I went ahead and I put in uh, May 3rd. So kind of for that, that Grand Island, uh, uh, Columbus area portion of the state, May 3rd is about the average last frost, frost date. So if we count it back physically, you can, see, you can see that the dates that I have put in here. So again, you know, like let's look at collards. So collards are pretty cold tolerant. You could actually be seeding those way back at the early part of March, as again, as long as the ground is not frozen and, and that it's actually workable, okay? So hopefully this sheet will help you determine, you know, when you can start various crops in your garden. Okay, so the, the, you know, one of the most important things when you're thinking about getting your, getting your plants going is the soil temperature. And you can find this soil temperature map. This comes from the um, um, High Plains Regional Weather Center. You can find a link to this map on our community environment website, which is communityenvironment.unl.edu. And if you go under the Hort Update section, you'll find a link to these soil maps. They're updated every week. As you can see, I pulled this map um, last Thursday 
uh, on March 25th. And so you can see um, at your location in the state approximately what your average soil temperature is. So in, in, in the Lincoln area, it was about 46. Um, you know, if you're a little bit farther west, you you may be at 40. Um, you know, if you're if you're way out here in the panhandle of Nebraska, you may still be in the 30s, 39, 32, way up in the corner of the panhandle. But those soil temperatures are important, and we're going to talk about that uh, quite a bit here for another couple minutes, because soil temperature is dictating whether or not those seeds you put in the ground will germinate. Okay, so every individual crop has a specific soil temperature um, at which, you know, which is the minimum. The seeds will not germinate below these soil temperatures. So here you can see a listing. 35 are some of our 35 degree soil temperature. And when we measure that soil temperature, typically we're measuring at about four inch depth. So I should have also said, if you would like to measure your own soil temperature and be very accurate for your gardens, it's easy to do. All you have to do is get a soil thermometer which you could easily buy from a garden mail order catalog, or you may be able to find at your local garden center. Um, and then just, it's, it's a lot like a turkey thermometer that you use in the kitchen. It's just a, a, a thermometer dial on top of a long stem. And you just push that stem, that metal prong down into the soil, get it to about four inch depth. And that's where you want to measure that temperature. So you can see here, spinach, parsnips, onion, lettuce, will germinate at, at very cool soil temperatures, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. At 40 degrees Fahrenheit, we've got, we've got a, a larger group of crops that will germinate. When we get up to 50, asparagus and corn and tomatoes will even germinate. And then we go into our warmer season crops there at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So each crop has a minimum soil temperature, but each crop also has a maximum soil temperature. And this is the temperature above which the seeds typically will not germinate at all. So when we get into the middle of the summer and our soils are very warm, um, you may see that you have trouble getting some uh, crops to germinate. You know, say for example, lettuce. If you're trying to do a midsummer seeding of lettuce, but the soil is very warm above 85, you may find that you have very poor germination of that seed. And it's just because the soil is too warm. So here again, you can see the, um, requirements for these different crops as far as their maximum soil temperatures is concerned. Okay, so let's take a look at specifically for, a, for one crop. So the optimum soil temperature for a seed to germinate is about five to 10 degrees above the minimum, whatever that minimum is for that crop. And, and below 20, 15 to 20 degrees below whatever the maximum is for that crop, okay? Um, and, and, okay, I'm talking about seeds right now, but this does also pertain to transplants, because if you put a transplant in the ground and the soil is too cold for that plant, those roots are not going to grow well either. And that plant will very often just, you know, we often anthropomorphize our plants. And, and I'm thinking like a tomato plant, you put it in the ground in the early spring, it's just going to sit there and the roots are shivering. It's too cold. It's not going to grow well, you know, so these soil temperatures are also important to keep in mind for transplants, okay? But as long as we're below that 15 to 20 degrees below the maximum soil temperature, the warmer the, germ the, warmer the soil is, the faster the germination is going to be on your plants. So in this picture, um, this was a grower uh, that had a garden in a community garden that I used to manage, and he created these really interesting, uh, I thought, uh, little cages. And actually these are onion plants that he had in, excuse me, these were potato plants that he had in these cages. And um, he, he made these out of some, um, uh, I think that's hog panel wire. And then he, he wrapped them with a plastic and then he had a, a lid, a, a hinged lid on each one. So on a warm day, he could flip the lid up and let, you know, the extra moisture and heat out. And on cold days, he could put the lid down and he could give them some temperature protection. So I, I thought that was pretty ingenious. Okay, so let's look at this example of carrots. So um, at 32 degrees, um, I should have I should have asked you to, to look real quickly. Let me let me just skip back here a minute. So minimum germination for carrots is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. All right. So 
If we have 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to have zero germination. So if your soil is that cold, the seeds are just going to sit there. Um, at, at 41 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll take 51 days for those seeds to germinate. Okay, so we're just one degree above the minimum temperature for carrots. So that's going to be that's going to be very very slow. Obviously, it, the soil is going to warm, but it, uh, faster than these seeds will germinate. So within 51 days, the soils will be much warmer. But in those early days when those seeds are in the ground, they're not going to do much. Now, if you're at 10, if 50 degrees, which is 10 degrees above the minimum for carrots, it's 17 days. Okay. If you're at 68 to 86 degrees, you're six days germination. So you can see we've kind of hit the sweet spot here that good soil temperature where carrots are really gonna, gonna get going quickly and they're gonna germinate right away. But if we get above that minimum, you know, 104 degrees in the soil temperature, again, we're back to no germination. So just keep in mind that these soil temperatures are important, but they're easy to measure, either doing it by yourself or just double checking with a map like the, um, like the one that I showed you available through CropWatch or through the uh, Community Environment website. Okay. All right. Now the early season crops are pretty cold tolerant and that's obviously why they grow early in the season, but there can be a situation where temperatures are going to get so cold that there still could be damage on these cool season, uh, early season crops. So you may still have to think about uh, providing some kind of protection in the early part of the season um, if, if temperatures are going to get very cold. So you could do something with a row cover. Um, in the top picture, you're seeing um, just a, um, an unsupported row cover, which is just laying right on the top of the crop. Or you could do something more fancy, like the, the picture you see in the lower right with the uh, PVC pipe creating a hoop over the bed. And then uh, that makes a nice structure for you to lay a row cover over the hoops um, if, if you need to provide the crops with some temperature protection. So depending on the, the, um, the heavy or the weight, of the a row cover fabric that you're using. And row cover fabric does come in multiple different weights, but the thicker and the heavier it is, the more temperature protection it will provide. The lighter row cover fabric may only provide one or two degrees temperature protection, whereas the heavier materials may provide, you know, maybe three or four degrees temperature, uh, which may, all you, may be all that you need um, uh, to provide for your crops, so. Okay, so the rest of the, the discussion today, I wanted to go into specific crops and to give you some tips and some thoughts on being successful with these crops. So that's what we're gonna spend the bulk of, of the rest of our time with. But before we do that, I wanted to point out this publication that we have available through uh, Nebraska Extension, uh, Selected Vegetable Cultivars for Nebraska. And so this is a nice listing of some uh, cultivars that have good disease resistance. And that's what you can see listed here are the various diseases that each of these cultivars are resistant to. So for say, for example, you're growing beans and you're having trouble with downy mildew. This DM happens to be downy mildew resistance and the PM is powdery mildew resistance. But it, it can help guide you and um, maybe help you pick out some cultivars that would um, have that good disease resistance. Or maybe you, you have had trouble finding, um, you know, a bush bean that you really like. Um, but and so this, cult, this publication also gives you some of the characteristics of those uh, plants, you know, you know, whether it has a, um, a stringless pod or whether it has a, um, you know, uh, Italian or it has a flat pod, you know, it just, just some of those kind of um, uh, characteristics. So here again, you can find this publication um, at go.unl.edu slash seed selection. And that's available for you to print off if you would like. All right, so let's, let's start off our discussion today with asparagus, um, one of our, our most early season crops. And um, uh, we'll, we'll be harvesting asparagus before too much longer, probably in just a couple of weeks. Um, typically, asparagus is grown from crowns, although you can grow it from seed, um, but that'll put you back another year. That'll, that'll um, give you an additional year of just growing the plants 
um, before you'll be able to even think about starting to harvest. So typically we, we um, purchase crowns. And one of the tricks with planting asparagus is, um, is you're planting the crowns deeply. So you want to dig a trench about a foot deep, about 12 inches deep, and you're going to put these crowns down at the bottom of the trench. And then um, after you've put them in the trench, you're going to cover them with about two to three inches of soil. Then you're going to let them grow a little bit. And you're, every couple of weeks, you're going to add a little bit more soil on the top of that crown until you've completely filled in this, this foot deep trench. Okay. Um, so that's typically how we plant asparagus, which is a little odd because we don't often, hardly ever that I can, can think of, recommend planting um, a, a plant that deep. But that's, that's the way that we do it with asparagus. So, um, you know, you, you'll get your plants off to the best start if you, if you loosen up that soil where those roots are going to be growing um, uh, and you can trench or you can double dig so that you're digging um, um, up to 20 to 24 inches deep and loosening those lower layers of soil, then kind of um, filling back in so that you're only 12 inches deep and then, and then putting your crowns in, okay? So you ideally you want about um, uh, 12 to 18 inches between plants, um, and you can do you can do either straight rows, uh, you know, which is kind of traditional, or you can do a wide row planting, which is where you would you would have you you would put in the first row, then you would go uh, 18 inches back from the first row, and then you would put your next row in in a staggered pattern. So you would put a crown between in the in the in between space of, of um, alternating from the placing of the plants in the first row. And then if you wanted to do a third row, again, you would go 18 inches um, from the second row and then you would do your next your next row. So doing wide bed plantings is something that you can do with pretty much all of the vegetables we're going to talk about today. And it, it makes much more efficient use of the garden space that you have rather than having a row of asparagus and then, a, and then a two to three foot walking space and then another row and then another walking space and then another row. You know, eliminating um, as many as possible of those walking spaces uh, will make more efficient use of your garden, okay? So um, one other thing I wanted to mention about asparagus is that asparagus has male and female plants. So um, the female plants will have these little tiny white flowers uh, later in the summer, and then they develop a green berry that comes on and then turns red in the fall. So the older cultivars, Martha Washington, Mary Washington, which we, we still see in a lot of garden catalogs, are female plants. But the male plants, we find, are, are actually more productive because they're not putting any energy into developing those, those um, seeds. So there's a whole series of asparagus um, cultivars that, that begin with Jersey. There's Jersey Supreme, Jersey Knight, Jersey Giant, and there's a, there's a couple of others that I'm forgetting. Um, there was a research study, a, a cultivar trial in Iowa that was done uh, several years ago, and they found that Jersey Supreme was really the best producing cultivar in that trial. Um, so if you're planting some new asparagus, you might want to look at some of these male cultivars, okay? Um, there's also the purple cultivars of asparagus, which are kind of fun to grow. Um, and you can still grow, uh, if you have the older female varieties in your garden, you know, that's fine too. Um, they just may have a little bit thinner spears and maybe not as many total spears overall, but it's, it's completely fine to grow them. Um, so I may not mention, I may not go over every specific item that I have listed on these slides. So if you have questions about something that I don't, don't discuss, please go ahead and put that in the chat pod. Um, I've got some information for you here on the fertilization. So typically um, you would uh, fertilize them as they're just starting to come out of the ground, you know, as the spears are emerging. Um, and then you might side dress after harvest so that you get good fern development during the summer because you need all of that fern development in the summer to have nice strong plants for next year. Okay, all right. Let's talk about onions and leeks. So a couple of quick things here. Um, uh, onions, starting off with onions, onions, we typically plant those from either sets, seeds, or transplants. 
And I would say of those three, the sets and the transplants are usually the, the most common uh, that you might, you might um, use. If you're gonna use sets, one little, one little trick is to make sure that you're using the smaller sets, okay? for the, the large onions that you want to harvest later in the season. Now that seems counterintuitive. Why wouldn't you use the larger sets? Because they're larger, they're bigger, they're gonna be more vigorous, right? Well, the larger sets will are more prone to bolting. And um, so it, it, we have found that it is actually better if you use the smaller ones. Use the larger sets, those that are over a dime size for green onions. So go ahead and plant them and then harvest them small and you can use them in the kitchen as green onions, but use the smaller ones for the bulbing onions that you'll harvest later in the year, okay? So um, the spacing, typically we want about one to six inches between the plants. I would say if you're going, if you're gonna harvest them as baby onions or green onions, that smaller, that narrower spacing is fine. But for the bulber, bulbing onions, you want to eventually get to that six inch spacing so they have a good area of growth for each of the uh, individual plants. And about um, 12 to 24 inches between the rows, but here again, we can do wide row plantings with onions just as easily and make more efficient use of our garden space. Now, onions are heavy feeders. So before you plant the area, you do want to do some fertilization. Uh, and I've got that recommendation for you here then you also want to do some fertilization as the bulbs are starting to enlarge, okay? Um, so yeah, keep in mind, they do need a, a good amount of nitrogen to get those nice sized heads. Um, they also need good moisture. Onions are, are not what we would consider drought tolerant plants. So if you really wanna have good, nice sized onion bulbs, you need to provide them with good consistent moisture. And one other, other kind of tip is that the earlier you can plant the onions, the better, because um, once they start to bulb, which is based on day length, every leaf, every leaf that it has grown in place, but by the time they start to bulb, will develop into one layer or one ring of the onion. So you want the most amount of leaves at the time they start to bulb to get those big onions. That means you need to have those plants in the ground early so they can develop as much foliage as possible. And that's gonna be the, the key really to getting those nice sized onions. So plant early, make sure you're feeding them, make sure they have good consistent moisture and make sure you give them enough space and you should have some nice, nice onions coming out at the end of the season. Okay, now leeks are, are fairly similar um, uh, um, uh, to onions. Um, one trick with leeks is that um, you want to plant them deep. So if you use a dibble, which is kind of a, a punch that you punch a hole in the soil, you want about five inch holes and you're going to plant those seeds um, deeply. And that helps to blanch some of the lower part of the stem to, so that you have that nice um, white section to the lower part of the stem. Now, leeks are not quite as heavy of feeders as onions are. So um, go ahead and plant the, get the plants in the ground um, early in the season, and then do a side dress of fertilizer in about in June. Um, and again, good moisture. Leeks do need good moisture just like onions do. Um, but similar to onions, you can pretty much harvest leeks at any stage. I mean, you can harvest them when they're still very small, or you can let them get big and um, harvest them when they're mature. Um, so Typically what you might want to do is just is, is plant your seeds fairly thickly. And then as they start to grow, harvest, uh, harvest some of them small, um, alternating between plants so that you're, you're, you're opening up the rows and you're giving more space to those that are going to stay in the ground longer so that they have good space to, to grow and develop. Okay. All right. Peas. So, um, Peas, again, one of our, our very cold uh, tolerant plants and peas will even tolerate a, a light frost, um, although the flowers will not. So if your plants are flowering and there is a frost uh, predicted, that's a situation where you, need to you may need to provide some um, temperature protection to make sure that those flowers don't all get killed, okay? But so soil temperature for peas, optimum temperature would be about 75. 
but they can germinate. Um, their minimum temperature is 40. So, um, you know, at the soil temperatures that we have right now, at least the eastern part of Nebraska, it's, it's plenty warm for you to go ahead and, and plant peas now. Um, the plants themselves don't do well under summer heat. So if you haven't ever planted peas before, um, you're not going to have success getting them much past the end of June. Um, July and August are not, are not happy times for peas. And so plant them early as a spring crop, um, or you could plan to plant them in the fall and, and have a fall crop too. So peas, again, are fairly heavy feeders. So you're going to want to incorporate some, some fertilizer in the soil before you plant and then um, uh, do some side dressing on them uh, uh, as, as they start to set pods and the plants are, are heavily loaded. So the spacing you can see for peas, about one to one and a half inches deep, so not very deep, um, one to three inches apart in rows. Again, you can do single rows or you can do wide rows, whichever works better for your garden. But uh, there, so there are bush type peas, which are fairly self-supporting. And then there are vining peas. And the vining type peas really will require some kind of support. And you, you know, you can see um, one, one uh, support method here that they just did with stakes and string, and that's fine. Um, there's many, many different ways that you can create a support structure for peas, just as there is for cucumbers and tomatoes. So whatever your imagination dreams up. Um, one thing you can do is use what's called pea brush. And so this would be where you're planting some bush type peas and then you're interplanting them with vining type peas. And the bush peas are actually providing support for the vine types. So the vine types will grow up and over them um, and you can harvest off of both. You can harvest off of the bush peas and the vining peas, okay? So um, moisture, for peas is really critical when the pods are setting on and they're starting to develop. So if we have a dry spring, which, you know, from what um, Nicole said earlier, sounds like we're going to have a moist spring, which will be good for peas. But if you have dry periods at your location, you're going to want to irrigate um, to make sure that those plants are vigorous and that those pods fill out the way that they should. Okay. So just some harvest tips, because we have lots of different types of peas that we grow in the garden, but um, garden peas, you want, to, you want the pods to be nice and plump, but you don't want the seeds inside to have gotten so old that they are starting to be starchy. They should still be young and sweet and crisp. Um, and then of course the, the edible flat pod type peas, you don't want the seeds to have really plumped out at all. You want those pods to be nice and flat. Um, and then the, snap, the snap peas is kind of similar to the garden peas. Um, you want nice, nice plump pods so that you can, you can uh, harvest them at that, that stage. Okay. okay, so let's let's turn our attention now to turnips and parsnips. And um, uh, just kind of a general comment about all of the root crops that we're gonna talk about, you know, turnips, parsnips, beets, carrots, radishes, um, all of those types of, of uh, root crops, they do their very best if you have a good, loose, friable soil. And so that means something that has good particle aggregation, it's got a good uh, level of organic matter, um, it drains well, um, it's, you know, just, they need to have a good, it, it's not rocky, it doesn't have a lot of rocks in it. They need to have that good, loose soil so that those roots can develop properly, so that they don't get forked, they don't get really misshapen, misshapen, um, uh, that's where you're going to have your best development on these, these types of crops, okay? So with that said, um, soil temperature for turnips, um, you know, anywhere from 45 degrees to 85. So, you know, your, your sweet spot's probably going to be around 55 degrees for uh, the quickest germination of those seeds. Um, spacing, only about a half an inch deep, and then um, 12 to 14 inches between the rows. Now, Turnip seed does need good moisture for, for uh, the seeds to germinate well. So frequent light watering is, is really important. And if your soil is more of a clay and where it might crust over after you do your seeding, then that's something you need to keep an eye on because that crusty soil can be enough to impede the growth and you may end up with a really poor stand where you um, have seeded your turnips. One trick, that I have heard some gardeners do is to put their seeds in place 
And then where the row is located, put a light dusting of sand over the row. The sand will help to hold a little bit of moisture on that soil surface. So the surface of the soil doesn't get dry and develop a crust that could impede the, the, um, the new shoot that's coming up from those seeds as they germinate. So that's a trick that you could try to see if that helps improve your um, a turnip or parsnip seed development. Um, so uh, you might um, you might thin or you might seed fairly heavily, but again, turnip and parsnip foliage can be used as a green. So if you want to harvest the plant small, um, then thin the plants, um, taking out the little young plants so that you get the, the remaining plants to about a six inch spacing. That's your ideal spacing to develop those nice large roots on either turnips or parsnips. And then of course you can, you can use the small plants that you harvest as greens, okay? Now, um, parsnips and turnips, you don't wanna over fertilize those um, uh, because you can end up with, with just a, a really heavy mass of foliage growth um, at the expense of root development, which is not what we want in this case. So you can do some, in some incorporation of fertilizer in the soil before you plant, um, and then possibly side dress when you start to get to that true leaf stage, you know, where the first leaves you get are gonna be the seed leaves, then the next leaves that come out will be the true leaves that have the, the, the shape that the mature leaves will be. And then you could side dress with a little bit more fertilizer at that point, but, but don't go beyond that because we don't want to, um, push these plants into developing just foliage and not roots. Um, again, good consistent moisture is important to get that good root development. And then, um, you know, you can, you can start harvesting when the roots get to the size that you like them to be uh, for your eating preferences. Typically with turnips, um, you know, they're going to be um, about a tennis ball or so at, at the head of the turnip. Um, and that's when we would typically be harvesting. Okay, so now parsnips are very similar. Um, the, the temperature, soil temperature requirements are similar and the um, spacing and the watering is all very, very much the same. One thing that's a little bit different on parsnips is that if, you, if, the, if the shoulders of your parsnips are starting to um, uh, develop at the, at the surface of the soil, it's helpful if you mound some soil up around the tops of those fruits to prevent the shoulders from getting green. Um, and that can just kind of blanch them a little bit to make sure that they stay the nice uh, purple or white color that you want on your parsnips, okay? Um, parsnips, uh, you can leave them in the ground even after, the so after we've had a frost, um, or you can even leave them in the ground over the winter and harvest them in the spring. So if you do a fall planting, you know, you could let those plants mature and then stay in the ground and possibly, uh, I've, I've even seen some gardeners take hay bales and put them over the rows of their parsnips so that the soil in the rows is not so hard that they can't go out periodically and harvest parsnips over the winter months. Um, so that's, that's, it's even possible to do that. But one thing to remember about parsnips is that their seed does not store well. So you really need to have fresh seed every year. Um, don't plan on storing parsnip seed for more than one year because you may find that the germination percentage on those, the, that seed goes down so quickly that you're just really disappointed with the stands that you get. So really fresh seed is needed for parsnips. All right, so a couple more root crops, our carrots and our radishes. Um, again, they need that good well-drained soil, good friable texture, free of rocks, especially if you're gonna be growing the very deep, uh, like the Danvers type carrots, which have a very a long, deep root. If you're growing the smaller, um, shorter carrots like Thumbelina or some of those others, um, you can get away with um, uh, less of a, of a deep soil. Um, but if, if you know that you, your soil gets more compacted or gets heavier or rockier at the lower depths, then you might want to choose your cultivar so that you're choosing a carrot cultivar that is not quite so long. Okay. Um, medium to light fertility on these guys. Again, uh, you can incorporate some, some fertilizer in the soil before you plant, 
Um, but if you overdo it with the nitrogen, we run the risk again of getting way too much foliage and not enough root development. Um, and then we do have to have good spacing. So most people don't use carrot foliage as a green. Um, so you're going to want that spacing to be pretty good or, or go ahead and seed your carrots and then go back and thin them so that you end up with about um, uh, one to two inches between the carrots so that they have enough, enough soil space so that they can really develop well. Okay. Um, now carrots are a little slower to germinate. They, ger they germinate about seven to 21 days. Okay. Whereas radishes are typically very fast, three to four days at a good soil temperature, and you'll have radishes up and growing. So you can use radishes to interplant with a lot of other vegetables. You can interplant them with carrots and um, the radishes will germinate fast. They'll mark the rows. So you remember where your carrot radish row was. And then as you harvest those uh, radishes, you know, a lot of radishes only require about, um, say 25 to 35 days from seeding to harvest. And so you're harvesting those radishes and then it's opening up the space for your carrots to develop so that they can develop to a good size. Um, but you can use radishes interplanted with a lot of other crops too. Um, so just keep that in mind. And again, you know, some folks like to use radish foliage as a green, uh, which you certainly can do. Um, but again, as we mentioned with the onions, good consistent soil moisture is important to have, especially with the carrots, since they're going to be in the ground longer, um, so that you have good, well-developed carrots that have a good sweet flavor. Uh, do provide them with good, consistent moisture. Okay. Okay. So potatoes. Um, you know, a lot of people think uh, Good Friday is is when you plant potatoes, and quite often that soil temperature is right. Um, so minimum soil, soil temperature for um, potatoes is about 40 degrees. Um, so again, here in Eastern Nebraska, we're, we're a little bit higher than that. Um, you can plant earlier if the soil is warmer, you know, warm enough um, and the soil is workable and not frozen. Um, but if you're, if you're doing seed pieces, remember that as you're cutting those seed potatoes apart, you wanna make sure you have one good eye in each potato section, and you don't want to plant them immediately. After you cut the seed potatoes apart, you need to let them dry for at least a week so that those cut sections will, they call it suberize, they will, they will seal over and they will dry out a little bit. And that helps prevent the seed potatoes from rotting once you actually put them in the soil, okay? So cut your seed potatoes apart into pieces, let them dry for about a week, and then you're ready to go ahead and plant, okay? So potatoes are medium to heavy feeders. So you might wanna do some pre-plant soil incorporation of fertilizer, and then also do some side dressing. And when we, when we use the word side dress, what we're talking about is taking a granular fertilizer and sprinkling it down the side of the rows next to where the plants are planted. And then of course that will dissolve and it'll move down into the soil and be available to plant roots. Okay, so side dress on potatoes, typically you would do that about six weeks or so after planting um, to get, uh, uh, to keep those plants growing and, and being very vigorous. Now, as the potatoes grow, and interesting, you may not realize this, but potatoes are actually modified stems. So they're not a root, they're actually a stem section, and they tend to develop right at the soil surface. So as you can see in the lower picture, if we mound up soil around the base of the plants where the tomatoes, or excuse me, the potatoes are developing, we, uh, it, that's a good practice because it shades the tops of the potatoes and it, it prevents that green coloration from developing on the shoulders of the tomatoes, just like we did for the, um, the parsnips. We can do the same thing for our potatoes. So in the top picture, you see a couple of potatoes sticking up out of the soil um, and if you look really, really closely, you can see that there is some green developing on those shoulders. And we don't want that. We want those potatoes to be totally covered by the soil, okay? So spacing on potatoes, um, about three to five inches deep. And um, if that's for early spring plantings when soil is cool. But if you're doing a planting later in the summer when soil is warmer, you can plant them deeper. 
and you can go about five to six inches and they'll do just fine. So um, tw uh, 10 to 12 inches between, it, uh, between plants in the row and about 24 to 36 inches between rows. But again, you can do wide row plantings with potatoes, just like you can with a lot of the other crops, okay? And then good soil moisture, good even soil moisture to get the best potato development. All right, so let's look at some of our greens that we can plant early season. And collards are one of the most cold tolerant plants that you can plant. Very cold hardy, um, you know, the minimum temperature is 45 degrees. Um, you can actually even get a jump on that by starting transplants in the house and then putting them in the ground when you reach that 45 degree soil temperature. And that, that gets you off even, even faster. Um, and if you're gonna do a fall planting, um, you can start the seeds about three months before that first frost and doing a traditional in-ground planting. And then you'll have some collards that you can harvest in the fall. So um, you can see the spacing there. Um, I won't say too much more about that. Um, collards are one of those, the, in fact, the greens in general, they do very well in the spring in full sun. But as we move into the hotter part of the summer, they actually can benefit from a little bit of light shade, especially in, um, uh, well, especially in, you know, when we're in the hotter months. So you can plant, and if you're doing multiple plantings of greens, which is if you want a continuous supply of greens throughout the summer, doing multiple plantings is typically what you'll, what you'll be doing. Um, you could plant the spring collards in full sun, but then in the later part or in midsummer, you could plant them under the shade of taller crops, like on, uh, in the shade of tomatoes or in the shade of corn or, or, or anything else that will provide them with a little afternoon shade, particularly when the, the sun is, is especially hot. Um, collards actually are um, perennials. So you could mulch them in the fall and overwinter those plants and then have uh, collards growing again very early for you in the following season. So that's, that's always an option. Now for lettuce, um, the best germination on lettuce seed, we usually get at about 70 degrees temperature. So that's a little ways off fresh yet, but you could still plant, you know, minimum temperature for lettuce is 45. You could still plant now. Uh, the plants will just germinate slower and will grow, will grow slower as well. Um, but the plants will withstand lot, mo light to moderate frost. So um, uh, keep that in mind. I've listed some spacings there for you, depending on which type of lettuce you're growing. So the crisp head or the, the, um, the firm head forming like an iceberg type, you're going to do about a 12 inch spacing on those plants. Um, uh, the loose leaf, you can just broadcast seed throughout an area. Again, you might want to do a maybe do a wide row planting of about 24 inches in width on your row and just broadcast seed throughout that whole area. And, and that certainly could be done. Um, the seeds, lettuce seeds do need light to germinate though. So they need to be very shallow, you know, an eighth of an inch. So you're going to just throw them on the surface of the soil, maybe lightly rake them in. Um, or you could alternately, you could put the seed out and then you could just dust some sand or something lightly over the top of them uh, just to uh, give them a little bit of protection, okay? But again, like the collards, full sun in spring, but they can benefit from some shade, especially afternoon shade in the middle of the summer when um, conditions are much hotter. But um, good consistent moisture, make sure that you control the weeds uh, because if you've got a lot of weed competition in and amongst your lettuce and your other greens, that's really going to impede their development. So make sure that you do good weed control. Okay. And then if you're going to do later season plantings, like mid to late summer, use a bolt resistant variety or provide some shade to try to um, prevent them from going to seed so quickly. Okay. Spinach um, is very similar to the, the other two that we've just talked about. Um, spinach can bolt or set seed for a variety of reasons. Um, if they're spaced too closely, if, if, um, if they, the plants are hot, if we get a, a period of hot weather, uh, once the days get very long or soil is dry, all of those things can cause spinach to bolt. So 
um, either look for bolt resistant cultivars and that, um, that publication I mentioned earlier can help you pick those out or provide the plants with some shade in the middle of the summer, make sure that they are, have good moisture. All of those things will help prevent the bolting. Now you don't need to provide spinach with a lot of fertilizer, but if you start to see that the leaves are, are not that really nice dark green that you expect in spinach and they start to get kind of light green, then you might need to do some uh, fertilization. And again, you could do some side dress with just a, a general purpose granular type fertilizer. Uh, that would be completely fine. Okay. The last of our greens is Swiss chard. And um, uh, again, growing Swiss chard is fairly similar um, to what we would do with, with any of the other greens that we've already talked about. So um, I won't say too much about this. Um, but again, bolting can be an issue in Swiss chard. We find if, there's sudden, if plants are suddenly exposed to cold or freezing temperatures after you have put your transplants in the ground, they tend to bolt. And then we know some cultivars are particularly prone to bolting, specifically ruby red and rhubarb are very prone to bolting. So if that's a problem for you in your garden, you might want to choose a different cultivar and see if that helps eliminate some of that problem for you. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of our, uh, our coal crops, the broccoli and cauliflower. And um, these, these crops, I have to mention, of all of the, the crops we've talked about so far, these are probably the most difficult to grow. So if you're a beginning grower, you might want to maybe not try these right away uh, because they can be challenging. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that's, that's challenging about them is um, they have a very shallow root system. And so they're not very competitive against weeds or if soils get dry, they don't do well. So you need to really control the weeds around them and you need to make sure they have good consistent moisture. Um, also don't over fertilize because if you over fertilize them, you can end up with hollow stems um, that don't develop well, hollow stems on, uh, under the heads that are developing. Um, the broccoli and cauliflower also can, can develop these small, tight, little button heads for a variety of reasons. Um, exposed to cold temperatures when the transplants go in the ground, if temperatures suddenly get hot, if temperatures are suddenly too dry. So again, they're, they're a little more persnickety about what they need to grow well. Uh, and you really need to keep a good eye on them um, for them to perform well in the garden, okay? Um, so uh, I think I have mentioned pretty much all of these same things for cauliflower. You know, they, they again, they're, they're very similar um, in how they grow, okay? Now cabbage, cabbage is a cold crop, but it's a little easier to grow. So um, if, if you wanna try this one, you know, you, you'll probably have a little bit better luck than you will with the broccoli or cauliflower. Although there are, there are quite a few insect problems that we see uh, loopers particularly coming in and chewing up your, your cabbage heads. So um, keep in mind that since you're growing foliage here, you're not looking for flowers or fruit that requires pollination. You can use row covers to protect your cabbages from the insects. And, and that's um, one uh, a method that's very effective and doesn't require any, any chemicals be applied, okay? So soil temperature for cabbage, minimum is 45 degrees, but ideally, you know, around 75 would be, would be even better. Uh, put your transplants in the ground if you're buying or if you have grown your own transplants about six to eight weeks before the last frost. We're about there right now. So you could put cabbage in the ground right now. If you're placing, if you're planting from seeds, they need to be rather shallow, half inch to three quarters of an inch, okay? Um, uh, don't do any pre-plant fertilizer, but do a side dress application after your plants are in the ground, um, about three weeks after you have planted them or three weeks after your seeds have germinated. And you'll, and you'll do about one and a half ounces of a 3300 per 10 feet of row, okay? But again, they're, they have rather shallow roots, as we mentioned with the broccoli and cauliflower. So keep the weeds under control and make sure they have good moisture um, so that the heads will develop well, okay? Um, and you, one other thing with cabbage is you can get head splitting, especially if you have a big rain that follows a dry period. So 
Um, good consistent moisture is important so that the soil doesn't get dry, very dry, and then, and then we have a big rain. Or if we have a big rain predicted and your cabbage are just about ready to harvest, you may wanna just go out and harvest them and don't let them be exposed to that heavy influx of rain and then potentially split. Okay, beets. Beets are gonna be fairly similar in production to what we discussed earlier with parsnips and turnips. They're, they need a little bit warmer soil. That's why I saved them toward the end. 50 degrees is the minimum soil temperature for beets, but they still need that good, loose, friable soil. Now, one thing about beets is if you're planting them from seed, the little, the little round seeds that you get actually are not, it's actually a seed capsule. And the capsule contains about three to four seeds in each one. So when you plant those, you're gonna get multiple plants coming up and you're gonna need to thin them so that you again have good spacing for your beets to develop. Now, rather than pulling them out and disturbing the roots of the plants you want to remain, it's really better if you trim them. So just take some scissors out, trim off the little plants you wanna get rid of. You can use those, those leaves as greens. Beet greens are, are you know, a great salad component. And then the, I, the, um, the final spacing you want is about six inches between the plants that in row that you want to have developed into a good large size storage beet, okay? All right, so I have a few resources listed for you here that you can check on that will help you, uh, will provide you with more information. Cornell University has a really great collection of vegetable growing guides, and they have a growing guide for each individual crop. And you can find all of the details, you know, uh, seeding time, seeding depth, spacing, fertilizer, all of that. Um, and I created a short link for you, bit.ly uh, slash VGG, and you can find those vegetable growing guides. Now, Cornell also has a really interesting um, they call it their vegetable varieties for gardeners. This is kind of a citizen science project where gardeners can go in and for a specific cultivar, let's say you, you love growing um, celebrity tomatoes, you can go in uh, to this website and you can put in your comments about what, how has celebrity performed in your garden? Or let's say you have one that just completely failed. It, it, it had all sorts of disease problems and it never produced well. You can go in and you can list your comments and you can tell other gardeners, well, this cultivar really did not, it, it was really a flop for me. It just did not do well. It was covered in powdery mildew. It had all sorts of um, alternaria leaf spot, whatever. And you can read the comments of other gardeners um, that will tell you how these cultivars have performed for them in their gardens. And you can find that particular link at bit.ly slash veg variety, B-E-G-V-A-R, okay? So this uh, selected vegetable cultivars link that I gave you earlier, I've listed it again here as well, um, go.unl.edu slash seed selection. And then if you really want to get in depth and you want to know all the, 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 the really scientific details, you can look at the uh, 2021 Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for Commercial Growers. And this gives you a whole lot of detail on each individual vegetable crop. And you can find that at go.unl.edu slash veg guide.